by Seymour Siegel Memorial Lecture in Ethics. Um, we're very pleased to have this lecture series here at Duke. It's, um, it was um, masterminded and funded by one of our graduates, Alan Siegel, who's here with us today and who some of you may know through his teaching in the labor law area. Um, the, the, um, this, the series honors Professor Siegel's brother, Seymour Siegel, and, and I believe there's something about him in the program, but a very distinguished um, theologian and ethicist. Um, and we're, we're just really pleased that, that, it's, um, that, that it's a project that uh, Professor Siegel wanted to support. We, we have brought in through this series people whose specialties are either legal ethics or medical ethics. We roughly, um, roughly alternate them every other year, although uh, we're, we've gone a little bit out of order um, this year in order to have um, our first choice speaker, um, um, Professor William Simon, here with us. Uh, and it, to do the honors to introduce him, I'm going to turn the podium over to our own Professor James Boyle. Again, thank you for coming, and um, I know uh, you're looking forward to this lecture, as am I. Thank you, Kate, and thanks to... Uh Professor Siegel and the Siegel family. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the list of prior invitees, it's really the sort of the honor role of ethicists. Uh, David Wilkins from Harvard, uh, Dr. Leon Cass, Deborah Rohde. I mean, the, the simply the best uh, and most interesting uh, scholars of ethics uh, have come and delivered this lecture. And this is one of our, our uh, most prized and also most enjoyed, I think, uh, lectures at the law school. So I'm very happy and indeed honored to be um, to be introducing uh, my dear friend, a uh, colleague of, of some years, Bill Simon. Um, uh, Bill is the uh, Arthur Levitt Professor of Law at Columbia Law School and um, uh, was previously at Stanford Law School and has really worked for most of his career in the field of professional ethics and also to a lesser extent um, community economic development, although I think one would also describe him as a legal theorist. Um, my relationship with Bill goes back, actually, a disturbing number of years. Uh, when I started teaching, um, when I was a newly minted law professor, uh, like many newly minted law professors, I was told that I was to teach legal ethics. Um, and like many newly minted law professors, as soon as I charitably could, I fled the field uh, as fast as I possibly could. Not because I was uninterested in it. Uh, I actually found it comp incredibly fascinating and indeed have kept up reading it to this day. Not because I thought it was unimportant. I thought it was actually incredibly important, but because it is an extremely difficult subject to teach, particularly for a new teacher. Um, it deals with incredibly deep theoretical issues, and it's something where the people who can be both scholars and teachers, who can deal in a serious way with the ethical uh, problems uh, of the profession, uh, be theoretically rigorous, and yet manage to speak to students so that they can connect all of that to their life in the law. There, is a, there are very few such people. Bill Simon is one. Um, the field of professional ethics in general deals with at least two basic central problems. The, the first is the problem of role differentiated morality. Um, lawyers know this as the question, can I be a good lawyer and a good person? Um, uh, or alternatively, why is Atticus the only nice lawyer I ever read about in fiction? Uh, this is the question, why is it that I can do things as a lawyer, which if done by an ordinary human being, we would think were reprehensible, impeach a witness I believe to be credible, perhaps lead, although not directly state, a, f uh, a, 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 a jury or even a judge towards uh, m conclusions of fact I do not myself believe in. Um, how is it I can do those and still be, and still be a good person uh, and still be doing something that is morally right? The second question related to the first is, can there ever be such a thing as a profession and indeed a notion of professional morality, some kind of autonomous, quasi-self-governing body with some degree of monopoly entrance uh, control? After all, we do, don't just let anyone practice law. We actually prosecute people who try to do so without going through this. The same is true of, of medicine. How can we maintain that notion, how can that notion survive in a society otherwise dominated by the rigorous pressure towards market provision of services. Milton Friedman and his ilk would say, this is just another monopoly. You people are just, you know, just setting up uh, gates to it. Let the market decide. The, those of you who are one else should be able to hang up a shingle and charge one third of the price uh, and deliver legal advice, and indeed, as should anyone, and let the market sort it out. That's the way we do it elsewhere. Is that, is that true? Um, 
On the, the first issue, the issue of role-differentiated morality, um, I remember still uh, when I was teaching, starting to teach uh, legal ethics, reading one of Bill's many seminal articles, The Ideology of Advocacy, which um, develops a set of ideas which he pursued over 20 years and culminated in the, the practice of justice, a theory of lawyer's ethics. Um, and one of the things I had been upset about up to that point, although I couldn't really articulate it as well as, as Bill eventually did for me, was that professional ethicists seemed to feel that their role was merely justifying what the profession was already doing. The idea was to produce a theory of ethics which followed the contours of professional practice like a slipcover on a chair. You could have a little thing in the corner that you disagreed with, but basically your job was to rationalize, not to criticize, to justify, not to bring any kind of searing uh, logical analysis towards. And I, that's why I was delighted when I opened up um, Bill's work and found that he had serious concerns with both of the dominant theories that justify role differentiated morality. The first one, that lawyers are just a cog in a system, the system as a whole will produce justice, and that's why the lawyer as an individual can do things that don't appear to be individually just. The second one, or cluster of ones, characterized by, uh, epitomized by Charles Feed's uh, article, The Lawyer as Friend, saying there's some kind of sacrosanct relationship between a lawyer and a client, that relationship so special that it can justify behavior that would not be justified towards the rest of the world. Um, in the same way that once uh, we have the, the saying that Bill quotes that, that, um, that a, uh, a, I, I, might, I might actually betray my, my, my country for my friend, that I would do things for my friend that I would not do for myself. And so Freed says, well, the lawyer maybe should be seen as a friend Bill dealt in that article with incredible care with those theories, both of which he thought, I think, contain um, uh, some truths, but both of which he thought needed to be maintained more sparingly and which revealed that certain kinds of professional practices perhaps were not fully justified. I still remember his discussion of Freed's lawyer as friend analysis. He saw something to recommend in it, but he pointed out that a friend does not normally take his other friend's goals for money and subordinate his own judgment in the process. That, Bill said, describes prostitution rather than friendship. Uh, he also said that one surely has to worry that uh, Freed's last example was friendship with a finance company. Well, I, I didn't reread the article uh, which I read 20 years ago in order to prepare these remarks. I still remember those words and I thought, now this is someone who's taking this stuff seriously. This is someone who believes that ethics matters and that it's hard, and you have to think about it carefully. Similarly, in the related question, how do we look at the question of whether or not there's professionally justified morality? There's much to deal with. Professions are monopolies. We do restrict entry. Sometimes we might do so for our own benefit. The professions have a long and sad history of excluding on other grounds. I still remember reading the ABA debates in the early 1900s that suggested that Latin should be required as a condition of entry to the bar in order to exclude those recent Eastern European immigrants, many of whom were Jewish, from the profession. This was the stated purpose. The response, yes, that could work, but then you'd allow the Irish in. This is not necessarily a history which gives us enormous faith in the ability for professions to self-regulate. And yet I believe, and I believe that Bill believes, that there is something to the notion of independent professional ideal, an independent professional morality, and indeed perhaps a justification for role differentiated morality. It's that topic he's gonna to take up today with his subject, the profession since Enron. Thank you very much, Bill Simon. Oh. Well, thanks, Jamie. That was incredibly generous, and uh, I'm very grateful to Professor Siegel and to Dean Bartlett for inviting me to give this lecture in honor of Rabbi Siegel. Uh, this is the first time in my life, I'm 57 years old, that I have been to Duke, and I'm also delighted to have that uh, opportunity. So um, the professions that advise American business, law, accounting, banking, are in crisis. Their members aren't fully aware of the crisis, and they have yet to suffer greatly from it. But crisis is unmistakable in the rigidity and the befuddlement of the profession's responses to the challenges to their longstanding practices from recent regulatory and business developments. For lawyers, the most salient of these developments are initiatives that regulate them as part of legal regimes focused on their clients. I'm thinking particularly of the SEC's Sarbanes-Oxley up-the-ladder reporting rules and the IRS's tax shelter rules. 
Both these initiatives disregard traditional professional claims to self-regulation, and they compromise traditional commitments to client loyalty. The professions have responded to such initiatives with dogmatic reassertions of longstanding positions. Thus, the American Bar Association describes its new commission on confidentiality more or less explicitly as a circling of the wagons around old doctrine, rather than as an effort to figure out how lawyering can respond to new business and regulatory realities. The resolution of these matters will turn in part on institutional power and in part on ideas. The legal profession remains strong institutionally, but it's weak in the realm of ideas. It is unable to give a core, coherent account of its core institutions and practices. And so far, it's proven unable to address, or for the most part, even to acknowledge key issues about the role of lawyering. The modern profession's claim to prestige and independence rests on a key contention that professionals can simultaneously serve client interests and the public interest. In this view, loyalty to clients is consistent with the public interest because it enables professionals to induce clients to behave in a way that's consistent with the public interest. In the case of lawyers, of course, the social payoff is compliance with law. This contention has become much harder to defend. Of course, a large segment of the public has always been skeptical. Right? That's we have lawyer jokes and pictures of lawyers as predatory and amoral in popular culture. But the bar seems to have increasing difficulty explaining, even to more sympathetic audiences, including many of its own members, how its work could serve and reconcile client and public interests. I want to suggest that two problems are especially troubling here. The first is formalism, the doctrine that only the letter of the law and not its spirit is binding. The bar has long had trouble defending formalism, on the other hand, it has never been able to renounce it either. Formalism increases lawyers' room to maneuver. It increases the range of things that they can do for clients. Yet formalism undermines the bar's claim that lawyering for private clients serves the public interest. If the compliance that lawyers induce means nothing more than conformity to the law's literal terms, then there is no reason to think that there's any social value in it. The second problem concerns the meaning of client loyalty when the client is an organization. Although a major fraction of the bar has represented corporations more or less exclusively for more than a century, the bar's norms of practice have tended to speak of clients as if they were individuals. They have thus tended to ignore the internal conflicts of interest that differentiate organizational from individual clients. Lawyers have a strong tendency to identify their corporate clients with management. They know that in principle, the corporation is not the same thing as its management. But they have no clear conception of what else it could be. Thus, in spite of themselves, they instinctively fall back on views that conflate the organization and its personnel. Until the profession comes to terms with these issues, it will not be able to respond plausibly to the changing circumstances of its business clients and the regimes that regulate them. The new circumstances present opportunities as well as risks for lawyers, but both opportunities and risks require reconsideration of longstanding principles and positions. Business is booming for lawyers, accountants, and bankers. For lawyers and accountants, the increased demand is partly the ironic consequence of a statute, Sarbanes-Oxley, designed to rein in their excesses. Nevertheless, recent developments raise important challenges to long-standing convictions. Consider two indications that fundamental change is underway. First, Sarbanes-Oxley. In 2002, as part of a broad legislative response to Enron and similar scandals, Congress mandated that the Securities and Exchange Commission pass rules regulating the securities practice of lawyers for public corporations and specifically a rule requiring lawyers to report managerial wrongdoing up the ladder to the board of a corporate client. The SEC responded with rules that, in addition to requiring up the ladder reporting, give lawyers discretion to report some wrongdoing to the SEC. The agency also proposed, but has yet to enact, a rule that would require that when a lawyer resigns because of client wrongdoing, the corporation report the resignation to the SEC. 
Second, the IRS tax shelter regulations. Responding to the explosion of corporate tax shelters, the IRS since 2000 has revised and elaborated its standards of practice for tax practitioners of all professions. The most controversial provisions requiring those who prepare tax shelters to maintain and disclose client lists to the service have survived several judicial challenges based on confidentiality norms and were confirmed by Congress in legislation last fall. Other provisions govern in detail the preparation and context of opinion letters in tax matters. Both these developments continue long-standing efforts of these agencies to regulate the professionals who practice before them. But both seem novel and even radical in some respects. For one thing, both represent authorities, uh, assertions of federal authority of unprecedented magnitude over critical and extensive areas of, federal pra of, of professional practice. Historically, regulation of lawyers has been the province of the state governments, especially the state judiciaries, who have tended to defer to the local bar associations. Federal intervention has been narrow and hesitant. As recently as 1996, Congress settled the dispute between the Department of Justice and the state bars by mandating that federal prosecutors follow state ethics rules. Sarbanes-Oxley is the first federal statute in the history of the Republic to regulate law practice broadly and directly. Both the Sarbanes-Oxley and the TAC regulations broadly preempt state ethics codes, or in some states would preempt them if they had not been revised to conform to the federal requirements. These federal interventions challenge a traditional understanding of the lawyer's role strongly expressed or at least protected in the state ethics code. This understanding emphasizes client loyalty and especially confidentiality, and it treats public responsibility as marginal or secondary. The SEC and IRS regulations impose enlarged and prominent compliance responsibilities on lawyers, and they have been widely attacked as disrespecting confidentiality norms. The duty to keep and disclose tax shelter client lists, though perhaps technically compatible with the canonical attorney-client privilege, which has not historically covered client identity, rejects the bar's hitherto successful opposition to attorney disclosure duties that are likely to deter clients from seeking legal advice. They do, in fact, as the critics allege, turn the lawyer into a conduit for information likely to be used for public enforcement against clients. The Congress and the IRS enacted the client list provisions in full knowledge and, in fact, with the intention that they would have this effect. The change wrought by Sarbanes-Oxley is perhaps less radical. As long as noisy withdrawal is forestalled, the rules do not mandate reporting outside the client organization, and they have not reduced demand for corporate legal advice, quite the contrary. Yet the bar complains that they are likely to reduce trust between lawyers and the agents of the corporate clients with whom they deal. And the rules unmistakably connote indifference to that possibility. In the aftermath of Enron, it is harder to see trust between corporate lawyers and corporate agents as even presumptively a good thing. The disruption of traditional institutions and practices thus seems to reflect skepticism about the bar's traditional understanding of its role and the value of its work. Key sources of this skepticism are the bar's ambivalence toward formalism and its ambiguous understanding of organizational loyalty. The first undermines the bar's claims to serve the public interest. The second subverts its claim to client loyalty. Enron's special purpose entities and tax shelters share a strong resemblance. They are both complex transactions structured by multidisciplinary professional teams for very large fees for the sole purpose of circumventing legal constraints. They have no business purpose, and they manifestly frustrate the public purposes underlying the relevant laws. The Enron Raptor transactions were structured so that illiquid investments that managers expected to decline could be removed from the company's financial statements. Notes from the board meeting approving one set of these deals described them as a hedge, but then noted, does not transfer economic risk, just transfers profit and lost volatility. The Cobra shelters were currency option transactions, the sole purpose of which was to create economically fictitious losses that would offset economically real capital gains. 
Henry Camferdam, an entrepreneur who sold his technology company in 1999 for about $70 million, was introduced to the idea when an Ernst & Young accountant called to say, as reported by the American lawyer, that e &Y had a plan that would make that capital gain disappear. Legal opinions from Jenkins and Gilchrist and Sidley and Austin and Brown and Wood would provide insurance. In many deals, the professionals charged a percentage of the tax savings they promised. Of course, the professionals defended these transactions, and they still do. The defense depends on formalism. The defenders do not dispute that the transactions frustrate the purposes of the relevant laws. Rather, they argue, first, that the de deals comply with the literal terms of the law, and second, that compliance with its literal terms is all the law requires. Both propositions are controversial. It's been strongly argued that many of the Enron transactions and tax shelters did not comply even with the literal terms of the law. Moreover, it is a matter of dispute whether the securities and tax laws should be interpreted to require more than literal compliance. The securities laws have very broad definitions of fraud and other prohibited practices that seem to call for purposive interpretation. But at least some lawyers suggest that literal compliance with accounting rules should sometimes be sufficient even for otherwise misleading practices. In the tax area, judicial authority seems to be more or less evenly divided between literalist and purposivist approaches to compliance. But I'm less interested in the specific mandates of the tax and securities laws than in the professional's general understanding of their obligations to law and the public interest and how that understanding shapes their conception of their role. All lawyers are formalists some of the time. No corporate lawyer would refuse to assist in a freeze-out merger with a shell corporation solely because the transaction is not really a business combination but a forced buyout. Although it involves a formalistic interpretation of the relevant statute, the courts have legitimated such use of the statute, and there are substantial reasons to think it, be con it can be consistent with public policy. Some lawyers, however, are formless all the time, or at least they are always ready to be formalists when doing so would serve client interests. They will invoke the public interest when it helps the client, but they do not feel constrained by any public interest that is not fully articulated in positive rules. They thus stand ready to exploit loopholes and technicalities, formal interpretations of rules that thwart their underlying purposes. Moreover, although the most popular argument in favor of formalism justifies it as a way of inducing regulators and legislators to clarify their intent and make their language progressively more clear, formalists do not feel any duty to confine their distinctive practices to circumstances in which well-functioning processes of policy assessment and revision are operating. On the contrary, a disturbing feature of Enron-style securities practice and tax practice is that they depend on or exacerbate weaknesses in the process of public policy enforcement and revision. Thus, Enron used literalistic interpretation of disclosure duties to justify the concealment of information that would have been needed for public appraisal of its practices. Tax shelter practice is designed to exploit the IRS's limited enforcement resources. Lawyers' advice in favor of aggressive tax positions is influenced by the low probabilities that public authorities will detect their practices, and practitioners sometimes go to elaborate lengths to make it hard for the agency to identify their products. For a substantial amount of the bar, such formalism is a key feature of the professional ideal. In the debate about Vincent and Elkins' work for Enron, Lawrence Fox of the ABA Ethics 2000 Commission insisted, clients are entitled to know that there are loopholes. If you want to change that, you have to rewrite the law. Stephen Gillers of NYU said, the job of the lawyer is to accomplish the client's goals within the law, and if that can only be done through a technicality, it's not the lawyer's fault. Attitudes toward formalism also surface in the positions professionals take collectively. The American Institute of Certified Public Accountants has been vociferous in support of formalism in opposition to the IRS's tax shelter rules. It invokes the, what it calls the right of taxpayers to arrange their affairs to minimize the, tax the taxes they must fairly pay and argues from that right that sanctions should be imposed only on failures to meet clearly ascertainable minimum standards. There is, however, another view within both law and accounting, 
It was concisely expressed by the Enron accountant Sharon Watkins in her famous letter to Ken Lay. She made no mention of any of the accounting rules Arthur Anderson and Vincent and Elkins relied on. Instead, she noted that the overriding basic principle of accounting is that if you explain the accounting treatment to a man on the street, would you influence his investment decision? Would he sell or buy based on a thorough understanding of the facts? If so, you'd best present the facts correctly. This appeal to overriding basic principle contrasts markedly with the preoccupation of the Anderson and accountants and the V&E lawyers with the technical requirements of Financial Accounting Standards Board rules. There is no indication that these professionals ever asked the question, is it misleading, or that if they did, as in a section of V&E's response to the Watkins letter headed bad cosmetics, considered the answer relevant to the permissibility of the transaction. Among securities lawyers, the most articulate speakers seem to be defenders of formalism, and those who have doubts tend to be silent or ambiguous. But the tax bar is openly divided, and a major contingent of practitioners, many in the big established firms, have taken a strong position against what they, along with the IRS, call abusive tax practice. They oppose the new shelter practice as socially inefficient while the securities lawyers have opposed SEC regulation of their practice with remarkable consistency, the anti-shelter tax faction, led by the tax sections of the American Bar Association and the New York State Bar Association, have supported IRS initiatives and even called for their strengthening. They support demanding due diligence requirements for shelter opinions, and they support the requirement that practitioners make shelter client lists available to the IRS. Note the difference between the premises of the defenders of Vincent and Elkin and those of the New York tax section. The idea of a loophole, a course of action that fits the letter but violates the spirit of the law, is unintelligible to the former. To them, as Gillers puts it, it's either legal or it isn't. But the New York tax section accepts the IRS's premise that there is, there is an important category of abusive practices that can be identified independently of the literal terms of the law. The practitioners on both sides of the formalism debate are not just arguing about the characteristics of prevailing law. The formalists do not argue only that they should give their clients the benefit of formalistic <laughs> manipulation because the law creates or accepts those benefits. The anti-formalists do not argue only that literal compliance is insufficient because that's what the law says. Indeed, what we might call the legal positivist case for formalism lawyers should be formalist because the law is formalist, is much stronger in the tax area, where the bar is divided, than in the securities area, where formalism is relatively unchallenged. In the tax area, there has long been an economic substance doctrine that condemns liber li uh, uh, literal but counter-purposive positions, but it has never been uncontested. There has always been at least a minority position that formal compliance is enough, and it seems to have gained ground in the past year. In the securities area, however, it is hard to square formalism with the open-ended nature of the Securities Act's fraud norms and the accountant's practice of opining with respect to financial statements, not only that they comply with GAAP, but that they fairly and accurately portray the financial condition of the company. Vincent and Elkin's position implies that a financial statement can be knowingly, knowingly misleading, and yet, so long as it complies with GAAP, non-fraudulent. There's no authority for this position, and some against. <laughs> Most importantly, the language of the securities laws prohibits statements that are misleading without qualification. It's hard to find loopholes in such terms. Yet formalism flourishes more in the securities area than in the tax area. Clearly, then, the lawyers are simply not simply taking the law as they find it. They are arguing for and against formalism because they see stakes for society and themselves in these issues. The stakes for the profession involve lawyers' own sense of self-respect and dignity, the image of themselves they present to their clients, and the profession's image before the public. The lawyer image that best justifies formalist practice is libertarian. It sees government action as presumptively suspect, and the lawyer is performing a valuable role in forcing greater clarity in the norms that authorize and regulate such action. Formalist evasion pushes the rulemaker to articulate its goals more precisely. 
The cycle of evasion and rearticulation moves upward to greater transparency in this view. Thus, lawyers market themselves to their clients as champions committed to minimizing the interference of government with their pursuit of their private goals. They justify themselves to the public as an essential institution of government restraint and accountability. Now, this view has long been, to put it mildly, controversial. I heard a couple of chuckles as I articulated it. Okay. Many doubt that the concept of liberty or autonomy on which it rests makes sense in the case of business organizations. They also worry that the checking of government access can only come at the expense of enlarging the potential for abuse on the part of private institutions that are no less dangerous. And formalism invites a kind of opportunism, the exploitation of normative ambiguity to defeat shared expectations that has little to do with liberty or accountability. Increasingly, the demand of formalism that government specify fully the obligations of citizenship before enforcement seems both too strong and too weak a condition of accountability. Too strong because the government lacks the ability to anticipate and specify in advance the full range of situations to which its norms apply. The increase in recent decades in the pace of innovation in financial markets has exacerbated this problem. Even if public enforcement resources were more balanced with private evasion resources than they are, the government could not keep up with the capacities for evasive innovation of professionals advising the private sector. Joe Bankman of Stanford suggests that the ultimate practical result of a consistently formalist tax regime would be that no taxes would be collected from any taxpayer with access to good professional advice. One might also predict the result of a consistently formalist securities disclosure regime would be that all corporate wealth would be expropriated by insiders. <laughs> But in other respects, formalism is too weak a condition of accountability. Formalism demands only that norms be specified, not that they serve their purposes. A formalist regime breeds not only counter-purposivist evasion, but counter-purposivist compliance. It's, for 30 years, I've had trouble pronouncing the word purposivist. Counter-purposivist compliance, costly activity dictated by the literal terms of rules that make little contribution to their underlying purposes. Formalism imposes no constraints on the substance of norms, and since the legal system despairs of generating formalistic norms for some activities, a vast range of enforcement activity has to be exempted from its demands. Thus, a formalist regime can coexist with a regime of extremely harsh intervention with broad prosecutorial discretion. We see the results of this in the securities area. Right, which is sometimes tolerant of evasive formalism, but yet can be extremely harsh with those it succeeds in catching. Think of Michael Milken's 10-year jail term, or Samuel Waxel's seven years, or Arthur Anderson's death sentence. The libertarian formalist model of lawyering has become a liability. The wedge that formalism drives between legal norm and public purpose undermines the profession's claim that its services have public value. This is increasingly true as the image of formalist evasion as the price of a cycle of progressive clarification of law comes to seem less plausible than the image of a downward spiral of reciprocally exacerbating legal rigidity and opportunistic evasion. There's another dimension to the problem. The libertarian formalist approach disables the professions from responding to the demands and opportunities of a style of regulation that is becoming increasingly prominent. Sarbanes-Oxley is a, one example of this critical trend. The trend extends to education, no child left behind, environmental law, Project XL or habitat conservation plans, product safety, hazard analysis and critical control points regime and food safety, for example, or occupational health and safety. Take your pick, a variety of OSHA programs. In this emerging approach to regulation, the regulator promises leniency, flexible accommodation, and technical assistance in exchange for transparency and collaborative information sharing on the part of the regulator. Among the characteristic features of these legal regimes are substantive norms that are openly and deliberately underspecified coupled with duties on the part of the regulated parties to themselves identify and clarify the ambiguities in the norms. The management discussion and analysis requirement of the 34 Act is an early example, and the Sarbanes-Oxley requirement that management assess the weaknesses 
of its internal controls is a new, newer one. In this approach, the regulator elaborates goals, and rather than telling the regulator exactly what she should do in order to attain them, orders the regulated to herself identify the most effective responses and both report and implement them. Moreover, explicitly or effectively, these regimes sometimes charge the regulated with the duty to disclose to the regulator deficiencies in the regulator's formulation of the rules. So an example is the restatement of Torts Third's provision on the preemptive effects of administrative regulation with respect to product liability. Compliance with administrative requirements immunizes the manufacturer from tort liability if she has disclosed to the regulator any information she has suggesting that the requirements are inadequate. In an important sense, these new regimes are a vindication rather than a repudiation of the legitimate goal of the libertarian formalist vision, the progressive clarification of the law. Like the libertarians, the new reforms aspire to produce a progressively clarifying cycle of revision, albeit one that moves much faster. Yet in the new regimes, normative specification is genuinely a means to clarification and understanding, not a shield from the pressures of public accountability. Where form diverges from purpose, practitioners are supposed at least to signal that in a way that facilitates convergence. They must report deficiencies in the regulations to the regulators. And where the norms are ambiguous as to what they demand, those subject to them have a duty at least to make their content uh, transparent to the regulators so they can assess whether the norms require rearticulation. These regimes try to co-opt the more technologically dynamic, socially responsible, and image conscious members of the relevant industries. These are firms that are not averse to standards that enhance public confidence in the industry, especially uh, if the standards are generally enforced so that their competitors are precluded from offering lower prices by ignoring them. This means that in any given field of practice, the client community is likely to divide in their attitudes toward regulation. High road clients will support regulation and want to participate in a way that makes the new regimes work. Low road clients will want to minimize regulatory burdens any way they can. The high road constituency means that lawyers who have a professional stake in associating their work with the vindication of the public purposes underlying the regime will have political allies in the client community when they work collectively for both regulatory and professional reforms that undercut opportunities for formalistic evasion. It also means that there will be demand from these clients for lawyering services that require both skills and attitudes different from those associated with formalistic evasion. These new skills involve the ability to assess and revise norms and institutional structures in the light of their evolving purposes. This is not an entirely new idea. It actually bears some resemblance to the vision of lawyering Henry Hart and Albert Sachs expounded in the 1950s. Recent developments in the economy and regulation have enlarged the opportunities for it. However, at the same time, we can see uh, that there's been a revival of the libertarian formalist ri rival of this vision. It seems doubtful that the libertarian formalist view and this newer one can be accommodated within a single professional vision. If the bar has to have a common culture and a common conception of its role and responsibilities, it must choose. The choice is not dictated by tradition or self-interest. But the, newer, the, the approach that responds to the newer regulatory regimes has the best promise of vindicating the bar's claims that its services to private clients further public interest. And it seems to present the best opportunities to enhance the bar's social influence and status. In the tax area, important segments of the bar have recognized this. The securities area is notable for the absence of any clear vision other than the libertarian one. David Nicolaysen, chief accountant at the SEC, recently complained at a meeting of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants about the compliance mindset of his colleagues, by which he meant both evasive formalism and defensive formalism. In rhetoric strikingly reminiscent of Sharon Watkins' forlorn exhortation to Ken Lay, he suggested that those who prepare financial statements should ask themselves what kind of information they rely on in making their own investment decisions and then use the answer as a guide to deciding on how to report on their clients. In the current climate, the idea that the information lawyers and accountants produced under the securities laws should be useful to anybody 
seems to come easily only to mavericks and government officials. <laughs> now, in its defense of its work for Enron, Vincent and Elkin said, when clients ask us if they can do something, our job is to figure out if there is a legally appropriate way to do it. That's what we do, and so does every other law firm in America. I've been focusing on how we understand the idea of lawful in such statements, and especially the relative roles of letter and spirit. Now I want to turn to the idea of client presupposed by this rhetoric. To suggest that a corporation lawyer's duty to her client requires her to do her best to effectuate a manager's request to find a lawful way to withhold information from the shareholders is to suggest that the manager is the client. Every corporation lawyer knows that the manager is not the client. Yet most corporation lawyers think and talk much of the time as if the manager were the client. Moreover, few corporation lawyers have a coherent idea of what a corporate client could be other than a manager. The bar's rhetoric shows a tendency alternately to imply that the manager is a client and to beg the question of what, if the client is not the manager, it is. In its opposition to the SEC's noisy withdrawal proposal, the bar repeatedly invoked a quotation from a decision by Justice Berger that distinguished between, on the one hand, the lawyer as loyal representative whose job is to present the client's case in the most favorable possible light, and on the other hand, the accountant, a watchdog whose ultimate allegiance is to the corporation's creditors and stockholders, as well as the investing public. Now, this distinction raises the question of what, once we exclude creditors, shareholders, and the investing public, is left for the corporate lawyer to be loyal to. Uh, managers may be the constituency that comes to mind. Uh, until 1982, about a century after the emergence of modern corporate law practice, professional responsibility doctrines spoke of clients only as individuals. Finally, the ABA produced Model Rule 113, which acknowledged that organizations were different. The basic idea of Model Rule 113 was that agents, managers, should be treated as speaking for the client when they had the authority to do so. This was plausible, but ambiguous. The rule provided more specific guidance for one troubling category of situations. In essence, it said, when the manager, uh, managers are acting illegally in ways likely to hurt the corporation, the lawyer should think about going to the board, not being too radical there. Uh, although the disciplinary rules did not address it specifically, there was another category of situations where corporate and civil procedure doctrine suggested that lawyers should stand back from managers, where managers had a clear and explicit conflict of interest, notably with respect to compensation arrangements and when they were sued as defendants in derivative suits. Here, the doctrine pre prescribed that managers get their own lawyers and corporate counsel take instruction from the board. Key ambiguities remained. Two are especially interesting. First, what was the lawyer supposed to do when the board was encouraging and acquiescing in managerial lawlessness? If we take seriously the principle that only authorized conduct can be attributed to the organization, then the board can no longer be regarded as speaking for the client. In this situation, the inference would be natural that the best way to protect the corporation's interests would be for the lawyer to consult the shareholders, the corporate constituency that would usually have the greatest stake and to whom the law gives the authority to remove the directors. In addition, or in the alternative, it might seem necessary to go to the government agencies with supervisory authority over the corporation. Yet when the SEC suggested in the famous national student marketing case that lawyers might go to the shareholders, or in its Sarbanes-Oxley noisy withdrawal proposal, that they should send a weak signal to the SEC itself, the bar rebelled. Most strikingly, it opposed such responsibilities on the ground that they undermine loyalty to the client. Again, lawyers seem to be forgetting that the managers were not the client. Second, how is the lawyer to understand managerial lawlessness? In particular, should any managerial breach of duty be deemed lawless hence triggering duties to go to the board and perhaps beyond. In practice, lawyers interpreted lawless to mean either breach of criminal or regulatory law on the one hand, or explicit conflict of interest situations on the other. But that left a vast range of decisions that were potentially breaches of fiduciary duty 
but not violations of specific legal commands or explicit conflicts. Takeover defense, for example. To require lawyers to routinely pass judgment on whether managerial decisions on such matters are in the shareholders' interest seems implausible, but routine deference to such decisions seems to ignore patent, if indirect, conflicts of interest. Mm. Now, it happens that a particularly interesting subcategory of such judgments includes financial reporting issues of the Enron variety. Enron's managers were not unusual in devoting major time and effort to conduct, the, uh, to conduct the only purpose of which was to create a favorable effect on its financial statements. Public corporation managers are constantly proposing and executing transactions intended to improve their accounting numbers or structuring transactions they would otherwise undertake in a different way to induce a desired appearance on financial statements. Earnings management is one name for this, and although it is controversial, it is more or less shamelessly indulged, if not promoted, by business professionals of all stripes. Long after the negative publicity about its Enron activities began, Vincent and Elkin continued to advertise on its website its expertise in the use of offshore entities to help business achieve off-balance sheet treatment for debt. Now, of course, many types of earnings management violate the securities laws. It's even arguable that all of them should. But the question to consider at this point is whether even otherwise lawful earnings management can ever be consistent with managerial fiduciary duties to their corporations. When the manager asks the lawyer, accountant, or banker to assist in earnings management, he is proposing to withhold or obscure information that shareholders would consider relevant to their investment decisions. Why isn't such a proposal a presumptive breach of fiduciary duty? It's no answer that the manager's duties are to the corporation, not the shareholders. The corporation's interest embrace the shareholder's interest in unbiased financial reporting. What if the manager asserts that the accounting treatment she is trying to achieve would be more reflective of the true financial condition of the company? This position has no credibility when the manager is seeking to withhold information entirely rather than just influence its presentation. Even where the manager's plan affects only presentation, it's questionable whether she should be heard on these subjects. Financial accounting is the most important mechanism of managerial accountability. To give managers influence over it is like allowing students to grade their own exams. I don't mean to suggest that how much lawyers should defer to managerial assertions about the interests of their corporate clients is an easy question. On the contrary, my point is that it's a hard question. The bar, however, has tended not to treat it as a hard question. That Vincent and Elkins could see its participation in the Enron frauds as a matter of loyalty to its client bespeaks deep confusion that seems to arise from a failure to treat seriously the meaning of organizational representation. We see the same confusion in the bar's anxiety about the pressures on corporate attorney-client confidentiality. The corporate attorney-client privilege is vanishing. The SEC and the Department of Justice now typically require corporations to make a clean breast of past wrongdoing, even to the extent of waiving attorney-client privilege, as a condition of settlement for deferred prosecution. <laughs> Auditors obliged by Sarbanes-Oxley to assess the firm's internal controls must often seek attorney-client communications, creating a substantial possibility of waiver. If the SEC adopts mandatory noisy withdrawal, that will be a further inroad. The bar is opposed to these developments, and the new ABA Commission is struggling to roll them back. Its argument, of course, is that this practice will deter candid communication to lawyers by managers, which is said to be good because informed legal advice tends to promote compliance with law. It is, in fact, quite debatable whether there would be any net cost to the abolition of corporate attorney-client confidentiality. Without confidentiality, managers would still consult lawyers because they have a responsibility to do so or because they fear liability for not doing so. If these motivations are not sufficient, it's far from obvious that the highly qualified confidentiality that lawyers could promise even before the new developments would make a difference. The bar, of course, has no evidence on any of these issues and has never sought to get any. But the key point for now is that the stakes in the debate over corporate client confidentiality are obscured in current discourse. Note that the rationale for confidentiality in the corporate context 
has always been out of phase with the contours of the doctrine that the rationale is supposed to support. If our only concern is to induce managerial communication to lawyers, we should give the privilege to the managers. We don't. The privilege belongs to the corporation, with the consequence that a board can waive at the expense of errant officers, and a successor board can waive at the, at the expense of an errant past board. This means that corporate counsel can never assure managers of strong confidentiality. Clearly, there is a competing consideration that holds us back from following out the logic of the confidentiality rationale in the corporate context. I'm unaware of any articulation of this consideration, but I think it's clear enough. Client loyalty. If the bar's argument were right, giving the privilege to the manager might actually induce more compliance. But it would not be tolerable because it would, it would often require the lawyer to remain silent in the face of conduct that was both unlawful and harmful to her client. To preclude the lawyer from intervening to prevent lawless harm to the client would affront all the values that give di dignity to the professional role. There is thus a strong tension between the goal of managerial trust and that of corporate client loyalty. If managerial trust and loyalty in lawyers is based on confidentiality rather than a shared sense of the organization's goals and norms, it will have to come at the expense of client loyalty. Confronting this tension more squarely might lead the bar to take a less hostile attitude toward the new regulatory initiatives that are compromising confidentiality. <laughs> the demands to cut back confidentiality do not occur in isolation. More often than not, they are part of the approach to regulation I men mentioned earlier that aspires to combine transparency with leniency and flexibility in order to induce collaborative, continuously revised public-private ordering. Mm -hmm. At least some corporate clients have an interest in embracing these new approaches. The assistance that lawyers can best provide in these new regimes has less to do with keeping secrets and more to do with problem solving devising more efficient and flexible responses that reconcile the client's legitimate interests with the public purposes of the regulatory regimes. The bar's current preoccupation with reassessing nervous reassuring nervous managers is misplaced. The project is superfluous for most managers and futile for the rest. It would take a revolutionary expansion of current confidentiality doctrine to enable lawyers to promise a manager that she will not be worse off for being candid with the lawyer. Moreover, in these new regimes, the most important kind of trust lawyers need to learn how to inculcate is not by trust by managers and lawyers, but trust by regulators and other participants in the regulatory regimes in the lawyer's clients. Such trust is the precondition of the autonomy and flexibility that the new regimes contemplate. Lawyer disclosure duties are entirely compatible with this latter kind of trust. In confronting the crisis, lawyers have two options that parallel the choices that the new regulatory environment presents to their clients. The low road, the one that demands the least effort and imagination, but has the least promise of neutralizing the threats to public respect and independence, is the one that most lawyers seem to be taking. This involves clinging to the prerogatives of formalism and an interpretation of confidentiality that rationalizes treating managers as if they were clients. The high road, the most difficult in the short run, but the one with the most promise for the profession and its role in society, requires the rejection of formalism and of the tacit managerialism of current confidentiality efforts. It requires lawyers to interpret their professed commitment to law in terms of spirit and purpose rather than literal terms. And it requires them to confront explicitly the tensions of organizational client loyalty, and especially recognizing the tension between client loyalty and managerial loyalty. That's it. Well, what? Is that what we do? So do we, we take questions now. If any, sir. Um, I'm a little curious as to what your view is of uh, of, of good faith as, as a fiduciary duty, which you know, has just taken on more and more prominence in, in state corporate law, particularly in Delaware, but also in other states that, that tend to follow Delaware, and how that might fit into your vision of a non-formalist approach to, uh, to lawyering. 
Well, the, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I want to opine as a corporate law, uh, a corporate law expert. It's true that, you know, fiduciary duties are always inherently informal, right? And so uh, I think the, the interesting question for corporate lawyers is what do, the, what, what do the manager's fiduciary duty say about the corporate lawyer's responsibility to the, uh, to the entity client, and what do they say about when the manager is entitled to be uh, heard as speaking for the client, right? Now, there's a tendency, it seems to me, that where, the, the, um, where formalism comes in on the part of corporate counsel is in this tendency to assume that the lack of authority that means that you can't defer to the managers has to be, mean the crossing of a very clear-cut line, right, as opposed to um, a, a more ambiguous breach of fiduciary duty. And um, uh, it seems to me it's not clear, it seems to me that, you know, managers are certainly entitled to a preference, but um, for the same reasons that the manager's duties have to be formulated informally, um, uh, one might think that, you know, lawyers will sometimes have informal responsibilities to draw the line as well. Yeah. Um, you bring up the tax code a lot, and I was just wondering how much you think uh, the whole writing of the tax code is written in a sense to ensure that you know there will be this class of people that can kind of find the whole. That can what? That can you mean the does Congress way. intend that? <laughs> well, you know, I don't. I'm not a political economist either. But for me, the interest as, as a legal ethicist, the interesting question for me is: Let's assume that's the case, right? What does that say as far as lawyers' duties are, right? Does that, in fact, mean, for, uh, one might say the argument is that, okay, if, if there's a cabal in Congress to secretly write tax codes to benefit the wealthy in this, in this, uh, in this fashion, one might say, well, okay, then lawyers should just effectuate the le legislative intent. But there's something wrong with that argument, right? Usually when we say that lawyers are supposed to defer to lawmaking institutions, we usually make some assumptions about how those institutions are functioning, right? With some kind of minimal accountability, some kind of minimal respect for democratic, uh, democratic norms. All of the arguments by which lawyers legitimate zealous advocacy within the bounds of the law assumes that the bounds of the law have been put in place by some legitimate process. So if we assume that you're right, it seems to me, um, it doesn't follow that tax lawyers should feel good about exploiting those loopholes, right? What follows, it seems to me, is that the institutional breakdown that makes that possible requires a heightened responsibility on the part of the professionals to try to assess the public interest. If Congress isn't doing its job of vindicating the public interest, then that means that anybody who has any self-respecting sense of professional autonomy ought to have more responsibility. Uh, Jim. You have adopted the reporting up functions you mentioned earlier, and I wonder what your feeling would be if what the role, what impact the reporting up function would have if the SEC further adopted the reporting out function of the attorney withdrew. Does that does that make it more likely that the attorney acts in a socially responsible way if there's a reporting out function, or does it make it uh, less likely that the attorney is going to push things too hard? Uh, for fear that they'll have to give up the engagement. Yeah, I you know it's yeah as you. As you suggest, it could, uh, it could go either way. Um, one effect, though, one might think is that attorneys would have more clout, for example. Um, they would have, uh, the, the resignation would have much more drastic consequences to the, um, to the uh, corporation and to manage, management. And I mean, it's interesting to me that attorneys are resisting this so much, because you might think they'd want to embrace it, because it will actually make them much more, um, make them much more powerful. Um, and certainly, you know, accountants have a lot of power right now, precisely because the, the, um, uh, of the rule that requires that their resignation to be uh, reported. Um, so uh, the, it seems to me additional clout would, might incline lawyers, if they were inclined to exercise it, uh, to be more uh, aggressive. Uh, now, you know, whether they would want to whether they want to pull back from resignation more because the resignation would have the public consequences, I don't know if I have a strong feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing I found interesting about the structure of your argument was, was, sort of, it was its teleological aspect <clears throat> that your account of professional ethics in some ways 
is derived from a prior account of what an attractive regulatory regime into which professional conduct ought to fit would be. Yeah. A relatively libertarian regime, formalist regime, or though you didn't use the term, I think the opposition is a posit, a relatively communitarian, as you put it, collaborative, continuously revised public-private ordering scheme. And a more cynical political economic kind of way to describe that um, regime would be that it's one that tries to create opportunities for virtuous norm entrepreneurs within professional or commercial communities to capture the power of public regulation, um, but to skew the capture process so that the virtuous tend to get the chance to capture power and, uh -huh. then, impose, and then impose it on others. So I guess I, I find this attractive, prima facie. I guess I'm wondering how far you feel you have to defend the attractiveness or the sort of viability over several generations of regulation of that kind of scheme against all the usual detractors in the capture theory camp in order to defend the professional ethics, the professional ethics view that comes out of it, or whether you think the professional ethics view you're propounding is actually more attractive, independent of the kind of teleological considerations, and that's just an addition to the picture. Yeah, well, of course you're right that the, the, the thing that, from a professional ethics point of view, um, what ethicists want is they want to conceive of a regulatory setting for practice that makes it possible to actually vindicate the traditional ideal that the professional serves the public interest as she serves her pri uh, private client. So to some extent, these new regimes are attractive to me because they do seem to have the possibility of vindicating that. On the other hand, I think it's very important that the professionals, whatever circumstance they're in, be subject to mechanisms of accountability. Right? So one thing about these regimes is that they're designed to induce accountability in regulated clients through transparency. And I think you know, lawyers should have similar transparency. One of the reasons I like the, uh, the IRS's approach is that I think it's in a step toward the auditing of lawyers by regulators. That is, lawyers will have power to vouch for their clients vis-a-vis -vis the regulators, but they ought to be accountable for the exercise of that power, and they ought to be you know, perhaps in some way audited. Um, and uh, uh, that's a step in that right direction. So I, I, mean, I think the answer is that you're exactly right about the lines along which I'm thinking, but it seems to me it is an important element of the picture that there'll be mechanisms by which lawyers can be held accountable. Professor Simon for a wonderful lecture. I believe we have a small reception outside, so please join us.